which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have touched. Welcome to the Amazing Collection, the Bible for Women, book by book. Tomorrow we are going to be filming the post-exilic books, and I am so glad that you could join us for this third set in the Amazing Collection. If you remember correctly, when we left the last set, the people were in exile. It was a very sad state of affairs. The northern kingdom had been exiled to Assyria, and 150 years later, the southern kingdom followed, only they were exiled to Babylon. It was a sad time for the people of Israel. But God had made a promise to them that he would bring them back to the land after 70 years and reestablish them in that kingdom that they would build a wall and a temple. These next five books were written after that exile, and they are books that help us see a picture of what took place when the people returned. Now, don't forget to do your workbook during the next books. It's a great adventure and you don't want to miss anything. And remember that the purpose is to learn for life the theme and the purpose and the characters of every single book in the Bible. So do your homework. We're in for a great adventure and I'm glad you could join us. We're going to have a good time together. I married a man who, on a scale from 1 to 10, is a 12. But he tells me that as a young man, he was not a great student. In fact, to this day, he has a reoccurring nightmare that he's on his way to take an exam and he has not prepared. But he learned from that. And when he started to work, he prepared for our future. He saved and saved, which was very important four years ago when he lost his job. He was prepared. When I used to ride to Grandma's house, There was a very dangerous curve in the road, and there were a lot of bad accidents there. People had died in that curve, and someone had written on a rock up on the hillside, Are you prepared? Preparation is very important, whether it's for life or for death. We're about to study the book of 1 Chronicles. It's a book about temple preparation. Now, we are starting a new series of studies. The first set of books were the Pentateuch, five books that dealt with the nation of Israel. They became a nation. 
the next set of books we called the kingdom books because even though in the book of Judges there was no king in Israel, remember everybody did what was right in their own eyes? But we came to 1 Samuel and the people demanded a king. So God gave them a king. The kingdom was established in 1 Samuel. It was united in 2 Samuel under King David. It was divided in 1 Kings and it was exiled in 2 Kings. There were 330 years of judges and 460 years of kings. Now the people have been exiled. Now remember there were two, two tribes. The northern tribes were, of Israel were exiled into Assyria. The southern tribes of Judah were exiled into Babylon. They have been exiled for 70 years in Babylon. And in the meantime, Persia has conquered Babylon and King Cyrus makes a decree that the Jews can return to their land. They can return to, to, to Canaan. Now this book is written to those Jews and as you see on the timeline, it is written after the 70 years. However, it is repeating information we've already read in 1st and 2nd Samuel. Those books were about the kingdom. Remember David and the kingdom. God repeats that same information but with a different point of view. Where that was political, this is spiritual. Where that, those books were about the kingdom, 1st Chronicles is about the temple. This is a book of temple preparation. The word chronicle actually means account or record of events. This book also has another name in the English. It means things omitted. And this book actually omits a few things from the book of 1 Samuel. For example, it omits the fact that David sinned with Bathsheba, that he sent her husband out to, to be murdered. It omits those bad kings we had in Judah. It does include 20 chapters of new information about all these details on building the temple. This book is being written to those people who have been exiled for 70 years as a book of encouragement. Now, we can easily divide it into two sections. And if you would open up with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 1, we have the first section of nine chapters of genealogies. Now, I told you when we studied Genesis, if you liked soap operas, you would love to study about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. When we hit 1 Samuel, I said, if you enjoy biographies, you would love the stories of Samuel, Saul, and David. When we come to 1 Chronicles, if you enjoy reading the phone book, you're going to love this book. <laughs> it is nine chapters of genealogies. And sometimes when you read these things, you think, I can't even pronounce half their names and who cares? But come to chapter 1, verse 1, because it starts with Adam. God, the writer starts at the very beginning. This was written by Ezra, which makes a lot of sense because Ezra was a priest. It was either written by him or one of his contemporary priests. And of course, the priests were important in the temple. This book is all about the temple. He starts with Adam, the first man. Adam had a son, Seth. Seth is not the only son of Adam. We know that. There was uh, Cain and Abel, they're not mentioned. So obviously this genealogy is of a particular line of people. We go through Seth's family. We come down to verse 4. We have Noah, Shem. Then we go through Shem's sons. We come down to verse 34. We have Abraham. Now anyone reading this would have first thought, Adam. I remember Adam. He listened to the wrong voice. He listened to Satan and God made him a promise. He would destroy. Destroy Satan. We come to Abraham. They would say, I remember Abraham. God made him a promise. He would be a great nation. He would have the land. He would have a, a descendant that would bless the whole world. This verse tells us that Abraham had a son, Isaac, who had twin sons, Esau and Israel. Of course, that was Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. You come to chapter 2. We follow the line of Jacob or Israel and we are given his 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. 
And then in verse three, we follow the line of Judah. See, we see that God is following a very particular family line here. You come over to verse 12 of chapter two, and we have Boaz. Remember Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, Ruth's husband, the one who was able and willing to redeem her, to purchase her. Boaz had a son, Obed, who had a son, Jesse, who had a son, David. There in two chapters, we've gone from Adam right down to David. And if we continued reading in chapter 3, we would find David had a son, Solomon, who had a number of sons on down through. And we have the genealogy of 21 kings from King David right down to the time of the exile. And your first thought might be, why does God waste that much time and effort and paper on all these people's names? I think there are three reasons, at least that I can think of. First of all, he is encouraging the exiles. These people have for 70 years not even been a nation. They've been slaves or servants in a foreign land. They don't have a land. They don't have a king. They don't have a throne and they don't have a temple. It's been destroyed. And to those people, he says, Remember the past. Remember who you are. You are descendants of King David. Remember the temple. You've had a relationship with God in the past. He's lived in your midst and you have worshipped him. You are somebody special. Remember in the book of Deuteronomy when I told you that I found out about my genealogy that five generations back that I had an ancestor that started a seminary and wrote textbooks. When I found out about him, it was like, I'm somebody special. I've got to live up to that. It was encouraging. And I can just feel what these exiles must have felt, that this was a boost in the arm. Oh, yes, we have to remember what God did. We have to remember the promises he made because God keeps promises. He promised us a nation. He promised us a land. He promised us a temple that he would always live in our midst. The second reason I think that he has included in these genealogies is because it proves who Jesus is. It proves he's the Messiah. We have this book of 1 Chronicles, which in the Hebrew Bible was the last book included. So a person reading that would read this genealogy and the very next book would be Matthew. Matthew starts off with the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and it goes through these same names. So what is God doing? He's proving that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus has a legitimate right to the throne of David. And the third thing these genealogies do, I think, is encourage us. You and I are not little blips on a screen or little dust particles on this earth. We have a name and our name is important and God keeps chronicles or records. He puts our name in a book. He has a book of life and your name can be in that book if you've asked Jesus into your life to be your savior. And he says when he puts your name in that book, he keeps records beside it. Look at chapter Four, for example, chapter 4, verse 9. He not only puts your name in a book, but he keeps records. He's, there's either good stuff or bad stuff written beside your name. We have Jabez, a man more honorable than his brothers. This is a very obscure character. This is all we know about him. But in verse 10, it says that he called on the God of Israel and he prayed a prayer that had four parts. He said, oh, that you would bless me indeed. Number two, that you would enlarge my border, that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from harm. And God granted what he requested. There is a man's name with something very positive written beside it, isn't it? That's quite a prayer. We're told that he was honorable and that his prayer was answered. But when you come over to chapter 5, verse 1, we have a man's name with a negative message beside it. We have Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. But because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph. Now that's a sad commentary, isn't it? He was the firstborn. He should have gotten the birthright, but the birthright instead was given to Joseph's two sons.
you don't see a tribe of Joseph, but there's the land of Ephraim and Manasseh. Those were his sons. As a matter of fact, half of the tribe of Manasseh settled east of the Jordan, half west, and so they're called the half tribes. And here is why. Joseph got double inheritance because Reuben lost his. Sad message printed in this passage. So we want good stuff written beside our names in the book of life. Chapter 6, he gives another genealogy, this time not of the kings, but of the priests, the Levites, actually, the tribe of Levi. And if you look at chapter 6, verse 48, he tells us that the kinsmen, their kinsmen, the Levites, were appointed for all the service of the tabernacle of the house of God. But Aaron and his sons offered on the altar burnt offering to make atonement for Israel. The Levites were the priests, but they weren't all priests. All priests were Levites, not all Levites were priests. Did you follow that? The first verse there tells us that the Levites were appointed to be servants in the tabernacle or in the temple. They had jobs to do. Some of them trimmed the wicks. Some of them carried the tabernacle equipment. Uh, they all had jobs to do. Some of them, the line of Aaron, were the priests. So all of Aaron's line were priests. The Levites were to serve in the temple, and so God gives us their names, their genealogy. When you come over to chapter 9, we know that this uh, book of First Chronicles was written after the exile because at the end of verse 1, it tells us that they were exiled to Babylon, and it even tells us why. It was because of their unfaithfulness. But verse 2 tells us who the first people to return to the land were. And guess who it was? The priests, the Levites. Why? Because God is concerned about the temple. He's bringing them back to rebuild the temple. And so the first people he brings back are the Levites and the priests. You know, for boring genealogies, we've just gone through nine chapters and we've learned quite a bit, haven't we? And you know, we can actually learn a lot from genealogies. I'd like you to listen to a friend of mine, Eleanor Sams, who learned a life-changing spiritual lesson by looking at her genealogy. Researching one's uh, genealogy has become increasingly popular since Alex Haley wrote Roots, his uh, moving account of tracing his ancestors uh, back to Africa. Well. I also have a very detailed um, history of my slave ancestors that was passed down to me by my grandmother. But uh, before I could record my roots, I had to be set free from a, a legacy that I inherited of secrecy. Whenever my uh, grandmother would tell the family history, she would always speak in this really low voice like she was sharing a secret. And uh, she would say that uh, her father was the son of a slave woman and her slave master. She told me that uh, her father had been told by his father that he was never to tell anyone about his ancestry. So my great-grandfather grew up as a son and a slave, a brother in property, skilled but subservient, and though he was educated, he always had to pretend that he was illiterate. And privately, he had a very close relationship with his white half-siblings, but publicly, it was always a secret about his ancestry. God has a way of revealing secrets. My great-great-grandfather wanted it to be kept a secret that he had a child by a slave woman. And probably the secret would have died with me if uh, my daughter hadn't uh, been required in a college course to tell a story that reflected either her racial or ethnic background. And uh, when the professor was walking around the class, he uh, said to my daughter, I want you to tell a Native American story. And my daughter looked at him like, why? And um, he said, you need to embrace all of who you are. I can look at you and tell that your ancestry 
is African, white European, and Native American. And when my daughter came home and told me, I became outraged. And I said, didn't you tell him you're an African American and you'll only tell an African story? And um, I always remember my daughter starting to cry and she said, but mother, we have other ancestors. And a short time later, I noticed a picture of my um, great grandfather. And it was so obvious that he was of mixed ancestry. And as I looked at that picture, I just started to cry because um, I had to admit at that moment that the bloodlines of his father were in my veins. And then I looked at a picture of my great-grandmother, his um, wife, and I had to acknowledge my Native American great-grandmother. So as I um, embraced all of me, all of my bloodlines, um, I was challenged as a Christian that I had to speak the truth. I could no longer have this politically correct ancestry. And it set me free then to begin to research my real ancestry. So I enrolled in a university genealogy course. And um, oh, it wasn't, I guess, a long time after I began to do this research that my daughter discovered that she was working with um, white descendant of my great-great-grandfather. And um, this young man said uh, that all of his childhood, he had always heard these whispered conversations of his older family members that had led him to believe, even as a boy, that he had non-white relatives. So when he and my daughter realized that they had a common ancestor, they began to greet each other at work as, you know, with hi cousin. And um, then, oh, not too long again after that, a historian arranged for me to meet a um, descendant of my great-grandfather's um, white half-brother. And the two of us, we began to share the family histories that had been passed down to us through the black and the white branches of the family tree. And they just fit together just like pieces of a puzzle. It was an incredible um, experience. When I started to try to write the family history, I realized that more had been passed down to me than just the secrecy. And at first it was um, difficult for me to begin writing because I discovered that also bitterness had been passed down through the generations. And an incident occurred in a prayer group, of all places, which made me aware of the degree of this bitterness. Um, a woman made a racially insensitive remark, and I found myself filtering her words against the backdrop of the stories that I had heard in my childhood of the injustices experienced by my forefathers in slavery and segregation. And then I transferred the negative feelings about these stories and her words to the entire prayer group. And I thought, I'm never going to pray with these people again. And almost as soon as I thought that, I remembered Hebrews 12, 15, which says, um, Let no one miss the grace of God, and let no root of bitterness spring up to cause trouble and defile many. And I remember that scripture because uh, something more had been passed down through the generations than uh, bitterness. Faith had also been passed down. The faith that was in uh, my great-grandfather, he passed to my grandmother, who in turn passed her faith in Jesus to my mother, and my mother passed that faith to me. So the um, simple faith that I had as a 10-year-old child when I accepted Jesus as my Savior, it grew into a mature faith when I asked Him to be Lord of my life as an adult. And I believe it was that mature faith that made me remember that my body was a temple of the Holy Spirit and that I wasn't to let anything defile it. And so I repented of that root of bitterness and I, in my heart, forgave the woman who made the racially insensitive remark. And I returned to my prayer group just feeling joyful. And um, 
I finally was able to write my um, family history. And I wrote it not to perpetuate the secrecy or the bitterness, but to uh, tell my children and my grandchildren and all the future descendants of my great-grandfather how uh, his life was blessed because he was made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, I include in the family history an invitation to the descendants to read a covenant of blessings made available to them through Jesus so that they and their seed might also be a blessing in the earth. We come now to the second section of this book. It's David's reign, but it has to do with the temple. And everything that we see him do is preparing for the building of the temple. Chapter 11, verse 4, for example. David and all his men go to Jerusalem. They fight the Jebusites and they capture the city of Jerusalem. All right, they have the Jerusalem because that's where the temple is going to be built. Then we come over to chapters 13 through 15 and 46 times the books of Chronicles talk about the ark. And in chapter 15, verse 1, it tells us that David built houses for himself in the city of David and he prepared a place for the ark of God. He even pitched a tent for it. And he said, no one is to carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord chose them to carry the ark. David assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark to the place he had prepared. Then verse 13, he says, because you did not carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us. And it goes on to tell us how they carried the ark on their shoulders on poles this time. Now what he's talking about there is, Remember how the ark, and remember what the ark was, the ark was the dwelling place of God. It was the holy of holies in the tabernacle. And that ark had been taken by the Philistines. And finally, they had returned it because it was cause, having God's presence in their midst was causing them all kinds of problems. And they sent it back, but it only came halfway. And it stayed there for a hundred years. Finally, David wanted to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. But remember, they did it the wrong way. Instead of the Levites carrying the ark on the shoulders like Moses said they were supposed to, they put it on a cart. It was a new cart. Seems like a good idea. They put it on a cart and started heading back home. And it, the oxen stumbled and Uzzah or Uzzah reached out and touched it and God killed him. So that ark had stayed in a man's house for some time, and now David is ready to bring that ark back to Jerusalem. This time, though, he says, we're going to do it right. We're going to do this God's way. You know, we can be doing the right things the wrong way, can't we? And it's kind of a lesson to us. Well, when he gets the ark back to Jerusalem, in verse 16, David appoints singers and he has musicians, and there are sounds of joy, and they make s sacrifices, and he appoints the Levites in chapter 16, verse 4, um, to minister before the Lord and to celebrate and to give thanks, and then he prays a prayer. In chapter 16, verse 8, you see this psalm of praise. He says, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing praises. Speak of all his wonders. In verse 15, he says, Remember his covenant forever. And in verse 30, he says, Tremble before him all the earth. David is a man who really seeks to worship God, doesn't he? His heart is always so tender to get right with God and so quick to worship him. Boy, sometimes I think I don't spend enough time worshiping God. If that's what we're going to do for eternity in heaven, I better get a little more practice here. And David did. You notice he says, tremble before him all the earth. You see, when they touched that ark and God struck a man dead, it caused them to tremble, didn't it? Because they saw the holiness of God and the awesomeness and the power. He isn't somebody to take casually. 
They had a reverence and he has a reverence. And that's what this book is about. It's reminding the people of their power of their God and their need to worship and reverence him. So in chapter 17, we won't read it, but God reminds David of the promise that he has made. And the promise was, David, you won't build the temple because you have killed too many people. You've shed too much blood, but your son Solomon will build. So he reminds him of the promise. And then he starts getting together the provisions. For example, in chapters 18 and 19, 20, there's a list of battles. Now, when you read this, this is another one. It's kind of like reading the genealogies. You get, don't get too excited about reading these battles, but think about it. Every time David fought a battle, he won, and he took home the spoil. Gold, silver, bronze, and guess what they used to build the temple? The spoils of their battles. So now we have the city site, Jerusalem. We have the ark, God's presence there. We have the materials to build this um, temple. In chapter 21, there's a repeat of a story we saw in 1 Samuel about David taking a census. And remember, Joab came in and said, in essence, it doesn't matter how many people we have, God's going to fight our battles. Don't take a census. God doesn't want us taking censuses. He wants us to trust in him. But David took the census. Look over in verse 7, chapter 21, verse 7. God was displeased with this thing, and he struck Israel. David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing, but now please take away the iniquity of your servant. And then God gives him three choices. He says, okay, you can have three years of famine, three months at the hand of your enemy, or three days at the hand of the Lord. And David says, let me fall under the hand of the Lord because he's merciful. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, Eleanor, you told us earlier that this book omitted the bad stuff about David. And now you're tell reminding us that he did something bad. But I think there are three reasons this story is included. Number one, it clearly shows us David's heart, doesn't it? As soon as he realized he had done wrong, what does he do? repents. Oh, Lord, forgive me, that man of worship. He's got to get right with God. As soon as he saw his sin, he got right with God. The second thing was, look at verse 1, chapter 21, verse 1. It tells us something that 1 Samuel did not. It says, Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. We didn't know that before. We, now we know whose idea it was to take this census. It wasn't David's idea. It was Satan's idea. And this is a spiritual book. That's a spiritual battle. David lost that spiritual battle. He was quick to repent, but he lost that battle. I think that's the second reason it's included. And the third reason is, as we read through the rest of this chapter, David goes out and buys a piece of land in order to build an altar to sacrifice to God. That land that he bought was the same land where Abraham sacrificed Isaac or offered Isaac. And it would be the same place that the temple will be built. Now we have the city, we have the ark, we have the materials, we have the temple site, we have the place to build it. So in the next chapters, and these will be a little boring reading, I will warn you, but let me tell you what he's doing. He's preparing the people He's preparing the people to build. He'll have to prepare the builders. You see, they need log cutters and they need stone cutters. And he gets those builders ready to build. He prepares the Levites and the priests. See, there are 38,000 of them. 4,000 of them do nothing but sing. They're musicians. 4,000 of them do nothing but guard the gates. And David gets them all organized and knowing what their job is. I think that's kind of encouraging for us. All the Levites' job was to serve in the temple, but they all did different things and they did it a different way. Don't you find that encouraging? 
You don't have to serve God the way somebody else serves God. God has something for you to do. Not once does God say that the Levites who trimmed the wicks of the candles were of any less importance than the priests who sacrificed the lambs. We're all important, and I think that's encouraging. He prepared everyone, and then we come to um, chapter 28 because he prepares to die. Now, he's already proclaimed Solomon as king. That's his first step in getting ready to die. But David is going to die because he's not going to build this temple. His son is. And so in chapter 28, verse 9, he says, O my son Solomon, know the God of your fathers and serve him with your whole heart. The Lord searches the hearts and minds. He's encouraging him. Don't reject the Lord. You are going to build the house. Be courageous and act. And then in verse 11, he gives him all the plans of the temple. And when you read down through here, he has very detailed plans as to how the buildings were to be built, all the uh, furniture, all the utensils. And he tells us in verse 19, David says, God gave me these plans and I'm giving them to you to build. So he concludes in verse 20, be strong and courageous and don't stop until you finish the building. David reminds me of a, a parent that's going away on a trip. Do you remember the first time you left your children when you went away on a trip and you say, now your lunch money, don't forget your lunch money, and your clothes are laid out and the food is in the refrigerator, you just have to heat it. You know, they make sure that the child has got the program and that's what David is doing. He's reminding Solomon of what he has to do to build this. And then in 29, he prepares the people to give. And David does that by giving himself. In verse 2 and 3, he says, With all my ability, I have given. In verse 3, he says, I've willingly given. So over in verse 9, the people rejoiced because they had offered so willingly. They had offered to the Lord with a whole heart. So now he has the people in place. He has the materials in place. There's only one last thing to do before David dies. And that is worship his God. So in chapter 29, verse 11, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth is yours, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Riches and honor come from you. You rule over all and in your hand is power and might. He is acknowledging how great his God is and everything he has comes from God. In verse 18, he prays for the people. And what he prays is that they will direct their hearts toward God. In 19, he prays for his son Solomon once more that they'll have a, he'll have a perfect heart to obey God. And then he closes once more, worshiping his God. Look at verse 20. David said to the assembly, Bless the Lord your God. So all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed low and did homage to the Lord and to the king. This is not a man who comes casually before God, is it? This story becomes personal when I realize that God always prepares his people. He prepared me by getting me in his word for years. And then one day, he kept me awake at night. I could not sleep. I went to the Word and I underlined everything that seemed to stand out on the page. And when I was through, I read this. Everything you fear has come to pass. You've strengthened others, now strengthen yourself. Trust me and I will deliver you. That event, that night, was followed by a string of events. My husband did lose his job. He had back surgery. He was in physical and emotional pain. My son had his teenage rebellion in his late 20s. A friend was killed in an airplane crash. Someone I loved and trusted not only lied to me but about me. And one day I was at the end and I said, God, you don't love me anymore. And God said, I love you with an everlasting love. Nothing can separate you from my love. I said, you've left me. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I said, then you don't care about me. He said, I'm a very present help in time of trouble. 
See, God needs us to be prepared temples. We prepare ourselves by putting his word in our hearts and minds and worshiping God.